The Life and Death of Hans and Sophie Scholz, a Protestant German brother and sister executed by the Nazi regime in 1943, February 18th, uh, for the high crime of their speech, uh, wherein they criticized the Nazi regime, their, their government, wherein they criticized their government in passing out pamphlets secretly, all right, they were passing out pamphlets in the towns and on campus, college campuses, that criticized the German government, World War II, 1940s German government. And of course, when the authorities of BCOT went to all that business, man, you know, they could have none of it. And so off with their heads in short order as it played out. Uh, they went to the guillotine. But what we have here is letters, diary entries of the sister and brother. Letters they wrote to each other, letters they wrote to friends. And I am just going to read some of this business here. <clears throat> this is uh, Hans Scholl. And I believe that what we have here is a diary entry uh, when he was deployed to the Russian front because he served in the German military. I think he was a medic. August 7th, uh, 1942. I am tired of doing nothing. And the dugout is shuddering and groaning because the Russians are dumping one bomb after another onto the runway. I am redundant here. I walk alone in the midst of meaningful absurdity. War holds me spellbound only between shot and and impact. The Russians are a remarkable people. It's too noisy though. I'll write about the Russians later on. About Mar Marushka Boris and the farmer who sang songs that evening and about all the others. So here they are deployed at the Russian front, right? Probably just getting obliterated, obliterating each other. I'm sure both sides were obliterating each other. And this, and Hans Scholl is commenting on what remarkable people the Russians are. No doubt he's talking about the, the civilian population. And here they are. This is crazy. They're in this place, Mar they're, okay, Marushka, Boris, and the farmer who sang songs that evening. So here they are on someone's farm, probably sitting around a fire, singing songs with some Russian peasants. <laughs> wow, bizarre. Here's, uh, here's his following entry. August 9th, 1942. Today is Sunday. I am in the sun, smoking. Dimitri walks past and greets me with a laugh. He laughs every time he sees me. A week ago today, we were in Yezama. I managed a visit to the Russian church there. The service different from other familiar to prosaic Central Europeans like us. I entered the spacious hall. The vaulted ceiling was black with soot. The floor made of wood. Warm, semi-darkness filled the interior, except where candles beneath the altar and the icons showed the sacred pictures with gold. People stood together in haphazard groups. Bearded men with kindly faces, wearing the finest of seraphens, actually craftens, women with their hair done up in colorful 
kerchiefs forever bowing low and making the sign of St. Andrew's cross with splendidly ceremonious gestures. Many bowed their heads to the ground and kissed it. The liquid gold of the candles tinged their faces with red, their eyes shone, and the murmur of voices gradually died away as the priest raised his own voice in song. The choir respond the choir 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 the choir responded with some magnificent chords. Again the priest sang, and again the choir the choir answered him, reinforced by many additional voices, bell like tenors and wonderfully mellow basses. The heart of all believers vibrated in unison. One could sense the stirring, the outpouring of souls unfolding after a long and terrible silence, souls that had at last found their way back to their true home. I could have wept for joy because my heart, too, was loosing its bonds one by one. I wanted to love and laugh because I could see that hovering above these defeated people was an angel. Stronger than the power of nothingness. Spiritual nihilism was a major threat to European civilization. But as soon as it underwent its ultimate development in the total war to which we have finally succumbed, and as soon as it veiled the mighty sky like a sea of gray clouds, it was vanquished. He's saying that spiritual nihilism, when it reached its apex in the total war and eclipsed the sky, was then vanquished. The nihilism, the spiritual nihilism was vanquished. In the, in the horror of war. Nothing comes after nothing, yet something must come after all values. Yet something must come because all values can never be destroyed among all men. He's saying that the spiritual nihilism that was a threat to European civilization could not destroy values. For in the end, in the terrible end that war culminates in, that, that values there continued, that, that values continued as, as, as war ends in death, and yet the truth of life persists on. Nothing comes after nothing. So it's a comment on, on the spiritual nihilism. Nothing follows nothing, yet something must come because all values can never be destroyed among all men. There still exist custodians who will kindle the flame and pass it from hand to hand until a new wave of rebirth inundates the land. The veil of cloud is rent asunder, as it were, by the sunlight of a new religious awakening. You know, maybe what we have here is some window into Hans's motivation for 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 the for the anti-Nazi literature that they were spreading on college campuses and in the towns and in the cities where they were traveling around where the white rose was traveling around. You know, maybe see what we have here is a return. He is saying that the values persist, right? The eternal hierarchy of truth cannot be undone by the tyranny of, of wretched mankind. Because nothing, the wretchedness of men that is nothingness, the nothingness that men seek to amplify in their you know, chasing after oblivion 
you know, cannot, that nothing cannot, nothing will not follow it, but rather like when the storm dies, if you will, when, when the, when the rush and the storm of man's evil subsides, the values that were always there continue on. And so maybe there was some motivation here. He talks about custodians who will kindle the flame and pass it from hand to hand, right? They're handing out these pamphlets secretly, of course, leaving them lying around. But, you know, that they, so maybe there's something here, something of his own, of his own assessment of what he sees himself as being responsible to. You know, at the beginning of this, he's like, the beginning of this, he says, I'm tired of doing nothing. Right? And the dugout is, sh is shuddering and groaning because the Russians keep dumping bomb after bomb. I am redundant here. I walk alone in the midst of meaningful absurdity. And then he goes on to reveal, you know, where his meaning lies. You know, what, what the, the, the meaningful action that is, that brings fulfillment, that is the real cause to which he is a soldier, soldier, that being, that belonging to this, this German deployment. The purpose herein is a purpose that he disdains. But the true purpose, the religious purpose, the faith and of God and of Jesus Christ, that herein is a cause that gives meaning to his life. From hand to hand until a new wave of rebirth inundates the land. See, that's his vision. That's the vision for European society. Still there exists custodians who will kindle the flame and pass it from hand to hand until a new wave of rebirth inundates the land. The veil of cloud is rent asunder, right? He was talking earlier about that cloud of war that covers the sky. that crowd of spiritual nihilism, right? But as soon as it underwent its ultimate development in the total war to which we have finally succumbed, and as soon as it veiled the mighty sky like a sea of gray cloud, it was vanquished. And what vanquished it? Well, the, the rebirth, right? the new wave of rebirth that inundates the land. The veil of cloud is rent asunder, as it were, by the sunlight of a new religious awakening. And you know, I mean, you know, man, when you read this, his, religious, his, his religious awakening that he references is God, is Jesus Christ, is Christianity. You know, and that would have been the religious awakening that would have been most customary, right, to European culture in the 1940s anyway. You know, a return, a return to, to faith, a return to the courage and the faith and the victory that is in Jesus Christ. I watched the Russian peasants' strong featured faces spellbound. Then I caught a sight of shadowy out of the shadowy corner where two women were seated on the floor, suckling their children. I was looking at a symbol of the inexhaustible power of love. I left the church and emerged into the harsh light of day. The sky was overcast. A little drizzle was coming down. And the road had been transformed into bottomless slush. Shellfire rumbled in the distance. Right? So he's, he's, he's deployed, right, at the Russian front. He goes into this church. He sees these people. 
he doesn't understand their language, but he sees these, these Russian peasants worshiping in their orthodox manner. Right? And he feels this unity and he 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 and then he goes on to talk about the spiritual nihilism that has encompassed the world, for that matter. And what will dispel its terrible bows, right? What will dispel that that nihilism that has embraced Europe in the total war, right? Interesting. Interesting. You know, it's it's crazy. You know that as I as I dig through this, uh, it's just interesting the things that you find in here. And I think that the, that the whole premise was to discover what motivates Sophie and Han Scholl, what motivated them, you know, to, to do what they were doing. Because it seemed, when you really think about it, it seems a hopeless, a hopeless errand to engage in, in trying to change the hearts and the minds of people in Germany in World War II. There's so much at stake. There's so much to lose. You know, they must have known that should they get caught, that it would be the end of them. They must have known that should the German authorities catch them, right, that it would be the gallows. They must have known that. You know, and yet it seemed in, imperative enough for them to be to be trying to be a lamp on a stand, right? A lamp in deep darkness, so says the scripture as regarding the word of God. And somehow Hans and, and, Hans and Sophie Scholl imagined themselves a lamp in the darkness, you know, trying to propagate truth in, in their despondent and broken and wrecked and ruined society. You know, at, at cost ultimately of their own lives. You know, it it would be interesting to try to come across the what those pam what were on those pamphlets that they were handing out. I know that those are there's record of that. I'll have to look into that and see if I can find some of what they were handing out. I know that it was criticizing the Nazi government. It was criticizing the war. Uh, that that I think that they were the case they were making that this this war it was will be the ruin of Germany, and of the German people, and that Adolf Hitler is a villain. <laughs> But it would be interesting to see if there was what spiritual overtones, what call to Christian faith that may there have been contained uh, in what they, in what the white rose was handing out. You know, because you see here in these writings, you see that there is a Christian, a, a Christian faith that it defines them, that as as is a crux and and an axle right on which their heart turns is their Christian faith and their love of the word of God and of the things of God and, and, and for prayer and for redemption and for Jesus Christ who laid down his life. There's so much in their writings where they, you know, where they talk about, you know, the sacrifice that God came and laid down his life for men, you know, so this was what they believed in. This was their faith, their religious belief, their, their view of the world is a God who came to lay down his life for men. All right, so uh, <clears throat> that's the vid. Take it or leave it. Be true, stay free.